What Next TBD is brought to you by Progressive. What if comparing car insurance rates was as easy as putting on your favorite podcast? With Progressive, it is. Just visit the Progressive website to quote with all the coverages you want. You'll see Progressive's direct rate. Then their tool will provide options from other companies so that you can compare. All you need to do is choose the rate and coverage you like. Quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back when you use it to buy the new Apple Vision Pro or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Apple Card and savings by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City Branch. Member FDIC. Terms apply. Alex Kranz has a lot of streaming services. Technically, Plex counts as one. Netflix, Amazon Prime, Paramount, I think Peacock right now, Criterion. Oh, you've got deep cuts. Oh yeah, Crunchyroll. I'm I'm all over the place. Alex is the managing editor for The Verge, and she's certainly not alone with her long list of streaming services, all of which can put a big dent in the wallet. How much do you think you spend per month on streaming? Ooh. I don't even want to think about that. More than I probably did when I had cable. Are they mostly like ads or do you pay to get rid of the ads? Oh, I pay to get rid of the ads. I I don't want to sit through them. Same. Yeah. Same. I asked about ads because last Monday, Amazon Prime Video became the latest streaming service to create an ad tier. Customers either have to fork over an additional $2.99 a month or be assailed by ad breaks in the shows and movies they stream. Amazon's ads are just one small window into how streaming is moving backwards. Now, originally, streaming seemed like a way better deal than cable. You could pay for one or two streaming services and have access to a seemingly endless supply of ad-free, high-quality content. But now there are so many different platforms. Netflix, Hulu, Peacock, Max, Paramount, Apple TV+, Amazon, Disney+, YouTube TV, AMC+. You get the idea. And customers are finding that these services may be plentiful, but they're far from ideal. The prices keep going up. Shows you're watching disappear without warning. Things that feel a little familiar. It seems like the era of cheap, endless adless streaming that we all loved, you know, 10 years ago is is over. Unfortunately, yeah, it, it's definitely over. Uh, I think they have all been kind of moving this way for a while. For someone like Amazon, this was always intended to be an additional service, just a perk for Prime, but it's expensive. They've spent a lot of money. They spent billions of dollars investing in their catalog of content. And at some point, they need to make money off that billions of dollars of investment. So streaming is becoming cable? Yeah, streaming is becoming cable. It sucks. Today on the show, the death of streaming as we know it. I'm Shana Roth, filling in for Lizzie O'Leary. You're listening to What Next TBD, a show about tech, power, and how the future will be determined. Stick around. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back when you use it to buy the new Apple Vision Pro or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Apple Card and savings by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City Branch. Member FDIC. Terms apply. 
This episode is brought to you by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations. So you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real world results. That's SAP Business AI. The era of streaming originally kicked off with Netflix and Hulu in 2007 and 2008, respectively. And the idea was simple. Cable was full of channels you didn't want to pay for and ads you didn't want to watch, and it had gotten out of control thanks to a few companies dominating the game. So streaming was supposed to give people options and freedom. But pretty soon, more and more companies started getting in on the streaming game, setting off what people have called a content arms race. Streamers wanted to make as many new shows as possible to get as many new subscribers as possible, no matter the cost. And for a while, investors were willing to throw in seemingly unlimited amounts of money to make that happen. Netflix, for example, shelled out up to $30 million per episode for shows like Stranger Things, which, sure, that show is a huge hit. But then you got Amazon, which spent over $700 million on a Lord of the Rings prequel series, which was not exactly a commercial or critical darling. I am not the hero you seek. Whatever it was you did, be free of it. One day this will be your kingdom. For a while, this worked out well for customers. Streaming services weren't that expensive, and there was a seemingly endless flow of new shows, many of which were quite good. For a lot of the companies that started from a tech space, like Apple and Amazon, it was, what are the additional perks we can provide our users? Somebody has an iPhone, what else can we give them? We can give them Ted Lasso. Someone has an Amazon Prime account, what else can we give them? And so that's what happened with them. With the more traditional broadcasters, it was, we see declining views on broadcast and cable TV, we know we need to compete in this new space. Particularly, we need to compete with Netflix and and Amazon. So let's build something and let's try to acquire as many users as we can as quickly as possible by putting a lot of money into unique content. The early days of streaming seemed like a pretty good deal for viewers. I mean, people had to pay for just the Netflix subscription. Maybe there was Hulu and It really wasn't that expensive. I think I remember initially I paid maybe $8 a month for Netflix. Yeah. And it seemed like there was just an endless amount of content at the time. And I feel like that changed very quickly. Yeah, it really quickly changed because once everybody started to see how successful Netflix was, particularly companies like at the time Warner Brothers and Disney, they said, well, we... We want that money. Why Why is Netflix getting that money with our content? We want that. And so everybody slowly started to take their content off of Netflix. I think a big one was when The Office was, was leaving Netflix because Peacock was going to take The Office back and put it on their platform and launch with that. And so everybody started to snatch back the things they owned and put it on their own services to say, okay, it's mine now and everything's going to be mine. And if you want to watch The Office or the Olympics, then you have to subscribe to Peacock. If you want to watch The Sopranos, then you have to subscribe to HBO Max at the time. What I find so interesting about the whole legend of the streaming services is that they were never actually profitable. And at the beginning, they were run by investors who were just sort of throwing money, just lots, I mean, lots of money at these services to build them up, get prestige, make new content, etc. And I could never figure out, like, why weren't they profitable? They have millions of subscribers in some cases. Like, why weren't these streaming services profitable? They were never going to be profitable just off of subscription fees because that was never the economics of TV. It was always an advertising business. And basic cable and and premium cable had subscription fees, but they also had a lot of fees that they would charge the cable companies that were distributing their content. And you lose that, and then you also lost all the advertising they were making. And so they were just making a fraction of what they could have made 
with advertising, which is why a lot of them, in particular Warner Brothers Discovery, when it was merged and, and David Zaslav took over, he was like, I want to make money with this thing. I'm going to turn on ads. I'm going to start selling my content back to everybody else. How can we make cash again? And nobody else had quite been ready for that. Everybody else was very stuck in, how do I hold on to my content and secure my little like castle, my little territory, and keep everybody else out except for the subscribers I got? We've been floating around this name, but let's dig into him. Who is David Zaslov? <laughs> David Zaslov is the CEO of Warner Brothers Discovery. Before that, he was the CEO of Discovery. They acquired Warner Brothers, and he very quickly turned things around. And he really shook up not just Warner Brothers Discovery, but the industry as a whole, particularly streaming, but also just film and TV in general. And it's because he comes from a different point of view. He He's not an artistic guy. He's a guy out to make money. And he's very candid about that. And he's very good at it, even if you don't necessarily agree with his policies. And so he's done things that have since become very, very popular in streaming. Uh, he was the first one to say, hey, I don't think this movie we're making is very good. I don't want to continue to work on it, even though it's done. We're going to just get rid of it and write it off as a loss and take the tax credit instead. And that was with Batgirl, which was a really big deal. R.I.P. Batgirl. Yeah, R.I.P. Batgirl. We never got to see her. Uh, but then he started to do that with a lot of other content. Westworld was a huge HBO production. And by the end, he was like, it's more expensive to keep it on the streaming service and pay the residuals to the actors and the rest of the talent than I want to spend. I don't want to spend that money. And so he said, OK, I'm going to take this. And he took a bunch of other shows. And he said, I'm going to bundle these together and sell them to free ad-supported streaming services like Tubi and Pluto. And they can deal with it. Why does everyone seem to hate him? He is very focused on making money. And Hollywood is an artistic community. Like, it's a, it's a very profitable artistic community. It makes a lot of money, but they still balk when somebody else comes in and is very candidly like, no, I'm here to make cash. And and that's what he's done. And he's not the only one. I think Amazon and, and Netflix and Apple TV, those are all people coming in from the tech space and changing the way Hollywood works because they primarily care about the money. Like they're, they love to make art. Art is a lovely byproduct of what they're doing, but they're there to make cash. And it's changing that industry in ways that is shocking everyone. So in a quest to make these streaming services profitable in the past few years, the streaming companies have started to do things that, I mean, if you're a customer, you probably don't love. Can you walk through the changes to subscriptions that streaming services have started to make? I, I think ads is probably the worst one. Uh, the other one is everybody started to say, no, you can't share your account. HBO was famous for saying, yeah, share your account. For years, HBO didn't didn't care about it because they're like, the more people you're sharing it with, the more people that are going to watch it. And one of those people might convert into a subscriber. And that's enough for us. Uh, now everybody says, no, if you want to watch this, you need to have your own subscription. And we're going to go through as many things as we can to make sure that happens. Uh, that was probably the worst, I think, of, of what happened besides the ads. But then you also just see there's this big issue of like content blackout. Like there's certain things you just can't know, can't watch on the services you might have previously watched them on. What about price increases? Because I feel like that's the thing that keeps hitting me is it seems like every few months I get an email from at least one of these streamers being like, actually, I know you've been paying this price, but now we're going to make you pay this price. Yeah, they were kind of doing the same thing Uber did for a very long time, where like in 2012, you could take an Uber from the financial district in Manhattan to Harlem and it'd maybe be like $30 and you'd be like, wow, this is cheap as hell you are not going to pay that price now <laughs> if you try to take that same Uber. Uber was basically paying everybody's travel fees, right? They, they were paying your bills for you. And streamers were doing the exact same thing. They were paying for it all themselves. They were eating the costs and, and saying, isn't this so cheap? Don't you want to live here and live with us and pay us money? And then they slowly increased it. I think Netflix has probably been the most egregious. That's the, certainly the one that people complain about the most. But they've all done it at this point. It feels, and this is going to be maybe a wild comparison, it feels like the drug trade where they're like, the first one's free and then they get you hooked. And it seems like all of these companies have been like, hey, we're going to let you have all of this stuff that you could ever possibly want for a tiny little bit of money. 
And oops, now you're hooked with us. And we're just going to keep on charging you more and more and more. And we know you're not going to go away. I mean, that was the that was the plan. Bob Iger, who is the CEO of Disney, when he talked about all this IP he acquired over the last 15 years, Marvel, Star Wars, Fox, The Simpsons, all of this stuff. He was like, I want to hold on to all of it so that people come to us and they want to live on our services. Because he, he was really quickly figured out streaming was the future. And if he owned all the IP, he could then kind of control the culture and you'd have to pay him money because your kids need to watch Bluey and you need to catch up on the new season of Mandalorian so that you can have interesting conversations with friends. Talk to me more about the bundles of subscriptions because as we've kind of alluded to, there's a lot of um, like groupings happening. You know, Hulu used to be its own thing, but now Hulu is kind of FX and it's also part of Disney. What is going on with all of these bundles, which again makes it sound even a bit more like cable? Yeah, there's a couple of different bundles happening. In some cases, like with Disney, they own a bunch of different streaming companies at this point. And so they're starting to bundle them together. And eventually, they're probably going to just make a super app. Uh, then a lot of companies are also starting to bundle in order to compete with those really big companies, which, to be clear, the big ones are Amazon, Netflix, and Max. Those are huge. Those have tons of subscribers. And everybody else is chasing after them. And so they're starting to compete by bundling with each other to be like, oh, look, if you go and you get, for example, Verizon, and we're going to give you free Paramount Plus and free Apple TV and free something else, and you're going to have a great time. Isn't this wonderful? And that's just like how we used to do bundling in the old days. It's it's just coming around again. And that's because those companies can go to Verizon and say, hey, give us money and we'll put this stuff for, we'll give you like free access to your, your clients, but we're going to get a sweetheart deal from you, Verizon, for that. And so that's how they're making the money there is they're, they're just partnering with giant corporations. And then sometimes we benefit. Sometimes the Apple TV subscription only lasts a year. And then you're wondering why you can't watch Apple TV. And then you're having to subscribe to it very late at night at your brother's house for Christmas. <laughs> Not based on anybody that you know. <laughs> no one I know. <laughs> I want to talk about how streaming has become cable. I mean, we live in a time where everything old is new fashion, food trends. And and now it seems like with all these changes that we've been talking about, the prices, the uh, ads, I mean, streaming is just becoming cable. Yeah, I, I waffle back and forth on this a lot because I cut the cord from cable in like 2007. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I cut the cord years ago. And I've aggressively tried to avoid doing cable and, and being in that ecosystem because I want to watch the things how I want to watch them when I want to watch them. And it's gotten a lot more difficult over the last few years to do that, even with streaming, even with the amount of money I'm paying streaming companies. It's a lot harder for me to watch the things when I want to watch them, how I want to watch them. When we come back, the changes to streaming aren't just changing how we watch shows. They're changing what shows there are to watch. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back when you use it to buy the new Apple Vision Pro or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Apple Card and savings by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City branch. Member FDIC. Terms apply. If you only have a 401k, you're not getting the most for retirement. Wait, what? Add a Robinhood IRA on top, then they'll boost it by 3%. You can do that? And if you transfer in any retirement account, you get 3% on top of that. Is there a limit to the match? No limit. Robinhood Gold gets you the biggest contribution match of any IRA on the market. Sign up for Robinhood Gold at Robinhood.com slash boost by April 30th. Subscription fees apply. Investing involves risk. 3% match requires gold for one year from first match. Must keep IRA for five years. Match on transfers subject to additional terms and conditions. Robinhood Financial LLC. Member SIPC. If you want to understand what is happening in the United States right now, you really need to understand what's happening with the courts, the law, and the Supreme Court. The battle between democracy and whatever this cage match is that we're witnessing, it's going to be won and lost at the ballot box, but it's also going to be won and lost in the courtrooms. 
I'm Dahlia Lithwick. I host Slate's legal podcast, Amicus, and we are doubling our output, bringing you weekly episodes from here on in, because how else can we keep an eye on the many trials of Donald Trump, the conservative legal movement's assaults on our rights, the Supreme Court's latest slate of environmental gutting, gun safety, eviscerating cases on the docket. So follow Amicus wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes dropping every Saturday morning. It's interesting because having ads doesn't just change the viewing experience. It can also change the types of shows that are made. I mean, if streaming services are working on an ad model where the number of views per episode really matters... Or it's, you know, they're worried about, well, there's an advertiser that won't do something that's super controversial. How is that going to end up playing into what types of shows or movies are getting greenlit? I mean, it's it's absolutely going to play into it. This is something I've written about quite a bit because I think this was my big fear from the beginning. Um, as we saw the consolidation of these streaming services and then moving into advertising is that you're only going to have a few people making all the decisions on content. And before they were making that decision by saying, OK, we're going to try to get as many users as we can. So we're going to make a weird show just for queer kids living in Ohio. And we're going to make a really, really cool show for Latinos living in Los Angeles. Angeles. And we're going to try to get everybody in our and in, in subscribe to us. And now they're like, no, I'm going to make one show and it's going to make a ton of money because I'm going to hit the biggest demographic possible. And it's going to be the blandest content possible. It's going to be no disrespect to my mother and the many other fans of NCIS. <laughs> but it's that the NCISification, right, of content where you're going to have a whole, you're, they're just going to keep going for what is the fastest, cheapest, easiest stuff. So it's going to be scripted wise, a lot blander, a lot less offensive, a lot less risky. And for unscripted content, we're just going to see a lot more unscripted content because it's super cheap to make. And that's why we're here. Welcome to F-Boy Island. So who would you be if $100,000 was on the line? Welcome to the circle. A new social experiment. Yeah, I mean, I feel like what you're getting at is the issue of content bloat, where With cable, you would get a bunch of channels that you weren't watching, but you paid for them anyway because they came with your limited subscription options. And now you've got like Netflix, Amazon. There's just so much stuff on there that I don't care about. I can't find anything that I do want. I will spend way too much time in the evenings just like scrolling around all the different apps going like find me something and then just wind up on Dairy Girls all over again. And there's nothing really that seems to distinguish these services anymore. They're all just full of loud things or reality people yelling at each other. It's a lot of stress. It's a pressure cooker. You're so phony. If you want a friend, buy a dog. I've never met another broker as rude as Noel. Yeah, I think that's the next kind of interesting turn is a lot of them, particularly Netflix, are going to have to find an identity, right? Apple TV has an identity. You can watch really good science fiction there and Ted Lasso. And you know you're going to get those things. Paramount has said, we're going to go all in on Taylor Sheridan and Star Trek. Very different audiences, but it's working for Paramount. Uh, And Max has said, we're going to do everything all at once. But Max also has David Zaslav at the helm. And that's this guy's whole business. He's been doing this for 20 years. It seemed like initially... A lot of these streamers wanted to get awards and prestige. I mean, back in 2018, Netflix had a major awards push for Roma, which is that Alfonso Cuaron movie about an indigenous housekeeper working for a Mexican family. You know, best picture winner one year was Coda, which is an Apple TV Plus movie about a girl trying to decide if she should go away for college and leave her deaf family members. And and a lot of movies like these have gotten dozens of nominations and awards, but it seems like these streamers are starting to move away from that. And I worry that we're going to lose that sort of sweetheart, soft content in the future because now it seems like everything Netflix is pumping out is some sort of like poorly scripted, no offense to the people working on these things, you know, action movie (laughs) or just comedy or something that's just very broad. Yeah, I I think Netflix is probably... The one we should be most worried about because just this year they lost their head of Netflix film, Scott Stuber, who for three years in a row 
led that studio to being the most nominated studio at the Academy Awards. And and he's departed. He's going to go do his own thing. And the people they're bringing in to replace him are more focused on general content. They're not necessarily focused on winning awards. And winning awards is expensive. It puts it's a it's a lot of money to go and win awards. And it doesn't necessarily awards don't mean more viewers. It just means more prestige. And now that they've got the prestige, they don't really need it as much. For a long time, people were talking about this golden age of streaming. Is that over? Very much so. I think I wrote a story about a year ago saying it was dead. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's dead and gone, and it's really, really sad. For me, the golden age of streaming was be when you had them going out and just spending outrageous amounts of money on things for such niche audiences. I'm one of those people. They took a film from the 1980s called Willow. It was not a very successful film, but I'm a millennial. I grew up on it. I loved it. And they said, we're going to go and make an eight-episode show all about Willow. Isn't that cool? I think that's cool. It will not shock you to learn. I was one of the few people who thought that was cool. <laughs> they took it off the streamer before I finished it. <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> it was a delight. Uh, but but yeah, that, that happened. They, they said, you know what? Not enough people watched Willow. We're just going to take it off the streamer, even though it's got some, a lot of very popular actors in it. We're not even going to bother with it. And that was kind of down to like what David Zasloff did, right? He said, you have the permission. Just yank this stuff. We used to do it in the old broadcast days. Just do it with the streaming days. These don't need to be giant repositories of all the content we've ever made, which really sucks for those of us who are hoping they would be repositories for all the content these studios ever made. So big picture, how much trouble are streaming services in? I don't think streaming as an industry is not in any trouble. It's going to persist. This is just how we're going to watch this content now. Uh, Different streamers are in different amounts of trouble. I think Netflix has a lot of challenges ahead of it because it does have a real programming issue. It's not programming as intelligently uh, as a lot of its competitors. Max is probably going to be fine because it has everything. And, and it just it has that kind of control, right? Same with Disney. Uh, the smaller streamers are the ones that are really going to struggle because they either need to consolidate, which would probably not be great if you believe in competition in the industry, or they need to increase their prices, which would not be great if you're a subscriber to those services. Uh, I think a good example of that is Paramount, who there's a lot of rumors, a bunch of different companies have been looking at potentially buying it. And it's it does well. I think it's like the sixth or seventh ranked streamer. And so you'd think it'd be fine. It's in the top 10, but being top 10 is not good enough, unfortunately. I'm curious, do you think that there is a better way of doing streaming from for consumers? You know, something that allows for these services to make money, but that isn't, you know, peppering everybody with a ton of ads or sky high rates. I mean, is there a better option than what the services are doing? There's a lot of potential out there, but it means playing nice, right? They could be working together to essentially give us cable and and give us those opportunities to just bundle everything together and see it where we want and actually choose what we want to watch. But most of them are reluctant to do that. The big streaming companies are much more invested in having you exist on their service in their little place where they can mine as much information about you as possible to sell back to advertisers. That's what they want. And they're going to fight tooth and nail to do anything else. Streaming radically changed the entire entertainment industry. What do you expect the streaming industry to look like in, say, I don't know, five, ten years? Do you think there's going to be another radical change that we're due for? I'm kind of curious to see what happens because I think a lot of what we've seen there was precedence historically for, right? Like what we saw happening with streaming to begin with and the kind of collapse of it. We saw that happen with journalism and YouTube. We saw that happen with uh, radio after TV came along. A new technology comes along, everybody takes advantage of it and they leave the old stuff behind and then they have to reinvent their business when they could have just modified it. Uh, 
And now we're in this new space where they've, they've reinvented their businesses, but we're in a massive transition. A lot of them are horribly in debt, billions of dollars in debt because of how much they spent on content. And at some point that check's going to come due and they're going to have to pay it, right? So it's going to be hard for a lot of them. And I think it's going to be messy. And if you have the opportunity to legally back up the things you like watching, it's probably a good idea to do that because that kind of idea where you can just turn on your TV and find whatever you want when you want it is gone. And it's it's only going to get worse from here. I'm, I'm sorry to be such a downer on this. Don't be like me and, and never know or be able to see the last couple episodes of Willow. <laughs> You'll never know. It was lovely. I had a great time. If I had a copy of it, I would send it to you. <laughs> Alex Kranz, thank you so much for joining us here on What Next TBD. Thank you for having me. Alex Kranz is the managing editor at The Verge and co-host of The Verge cast. And that's it for today's show. What Next TBD is produced by Evan Campbell and Anna Phillips. Our show is edited by Nia Armstrong Lopez. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio for Slate. TBD is part of the larger What Next family. TBD is also part of Future Tense, a partnership of Slate, Arizona State University, and New America. If you're a fan of the show, and I really hope you are, I have a small request for you. Please become a Slate Plus member. Just head on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus to sign up and start getting all kinds of extra goodies. We'll be back next week with more episodes. I'm Shayna Roth, filling in for Lizzie O'Leary. You can find me on Instagram and threads. I'm at Shayna R, that's C-H-E-Y-N-A dash R. Same for X, though to a much lesser extent. I also have a Substack you can check out. Thanks for listening. Today is the beginning of a new year and a new decade. The nation and the world says goodbye to the 1980s and looks to the 90s. Kawabunga. I'm Josh Levine. You can't touch this. And for the next season of Slate's podcast, One Year, we're slipping on some incredibly baggy pants and taking you back to 1990. You'll hear about the single dad who fought back against big tobacco, all while hiding behind a secret identity. I'm looking around like people were at the bus stop looking at us, and I was like, oh my God. And here comes a police car. In Cincinnati, an art exhibit became a battleground over the First Amendment. I remember one of my board members said, so what's this? And I said, well, it's called fisting. And, and she said, oh, fisting, How, what's that all about? One Year, 1990. Available now, wherever you get your podcasts.